What is up everybody? So we're continuing our journey of using machine learning models for stock trading. And today we're looking at what happens if we use all the different tree-based machine learning algorithms that we've learned in order to buy stocks. And so before we even get into the different models we're going to use in the methodology, let's just answer a really fundamental question, or rather two questions. One, why would we expect trees to work well for stock trading? And secondly, why would we not expect trees to work well for stock trading? And interestingly enough, the answer to both is based in the nature of how tree-based models work, which is that we are splitting. We are creating decisions that says, is this feature less than a value or is it greater than that value? Now, to answer the question of why would this lead to something weak, a weak model, because it's such a limited architecture. It's basically saying that you have to make a decision about what the stock's return is going to be tomorrow only by answering all of these set of yes or no questions. And yes, you can have many, many, many of these yes or no questions or arrange them in very special ways, as we know for random forests or GBDTs. But at the end of the day, the fundamental basic atom of your model is still asking these yes or no questions, which can be a limiting architecture. Now, as I was hinting at before, that can also be the strength of this model because people in the real world make a lot of decisions based on these splits. For example, I might say, if Microsoft stock goes up by 1% today, then I'm going to buy it tomorrow. And a lot of people do have these thresholds in mind, these thresholds they're comfortable with, above which they'll buy, below which they won't buy, above which they'll make one decision, below which they'll make a different decision. And if that is truly how the world is operating, and if enough people who are trading in the stock market are thinking in that way, then it may be exactly, it may be exactly tree-based models that are able to pick up on those nuances. Now, obviously I'm making tons of assumption there, but that is basically in a nutshell why we would expect trees to work for stock trading and also why we would expect trees to fail miserably for stock trading. But now let's get into the actual method. I'm gonna take some time and make the method more rigorous today based on comments you've been giving in previous videos in this series. We're going to be using four different tree-based methods. We're going to be using decision trees, extra trees, random forest, and GBDT. Now, this isn't a video where I go into the nuances of each one. I'll be posting videos in the description below where you can learn about all these different things. But what I will say here is that let's talk about which of these models have higher bias and which of them have higher variance in terms of the classic bias variance trade-off in data science. So they've been arranged here such that if you go from the top to the bottom of the list, you're going to get higher bias. What that means is that the model at the very top here, the decision tree, has the lowest bias, meaning it's fitting the training data the best. The model at the bottom here is not doing that. But the trade-off we get is that as you go lower down this list, you get lower and lower variance, which means we expect models that are going lower and lower down this list to generalize better to unseen data sets. A decision tree is very closely tied to the training data, but it may not generalize very well to unseen data sets. A GBDT is less tied to the training data, but it is theoretically more able to generalize to unseen data sets. And so that's what I'll say about these four models. We're also gonna be using a linear regression as a control model today. So in all, we're gonna be trying out five different models, these four tree-based models and the linear regression. And we're gonna be using as features the lagged returns of any given ticker. And our features in this process are gonna be the returns from one day ago, two days ago, three, four, five days ago, and then also the lag return from two weeks ago and three weeks ago. So those are gonna be the features we're using today. Keeping our feature set simple today, really trying to put the emphasis on the differences between these different architectures we might use, these tree-based architectures we might use in order to predict the return of the stock tomorrow. So now I'm gonna outline the methodology that we're gonna use, and I'm gonna be really, really clear here. So we're gonna say given some ticker T, we can just say that's Microsoft stock, for example, and given some model M, so a model from this set here and also the linear regression, here's how we're going to be evaluating if that model is going to be good or bad at predicting the next day's return for that ticker T. We're gonna create a giant window that looks back in time. So here's today's time period at now, and we're gonna be looking back in time, and we're gonna be rolling a 100-day window backwards, backwards, backwards in time, one day at a time. So how does this actually work? First, we're gonna be looking at one day ago, all the way back to 101 days ago. That's what this purple window, which makes up 100 days, is trying to say. Now for the 99, the first 99 of those 100 days, we're gonna be training a model M. So for example, that could be a decision tree. Then we're gonna be using that trained decision tree, which again was trained on those features, those lagged returns, and the label was the return for the next day. 
we're going to be taking that train model and using it to predict what the return would have been for this unseen next day. And the rule we're going to be using today is if that predicted return for that unseen day, r hat, is bigger than positive 0.5%, we're going to go ahead and buy that stock in the beginning of the day and sell it at the end of the day. And so that's just the decision for 100 day window. The next thing we do is slide this purple window you see here one day backward in time. Then we take the first 99 days there, train another decision tree, which is going to be different because it's on a different set of 99 days. And we're going to be using that model to predict the next day. Then we roll that window back, 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 back. And we just keep doing that for 365 days in the past. So basically, even though this seems a little complicated, in a nutshell, what we're trying to do is saying that I want to know how a decision tree does if we're using it to predict the return for the next day and using this rule to decide if we're going to buy that stock based on the prediction of the model. So in order to figure out how a decision tree does, I'm going to run every single ticker in the S&P 500, all of these tickers T. And for every single ticker in the S&P 500, I'm going to train a bunch of these decision trees at different points in time over the last year and use all those trained decision trees to predict what the return would be the next day and use that prediction to decide if I'm going to buy the stock the next day. And I do that for every single model. So I go through this process for decision trees, extra trees, random forest, GBDT, and linear regression. And what we'll be able to do at that point is draw these distributions of the excess return of using that method of using a decision tree or an extra trees or a linear regression to buy stocks, the excess return of using that method over just buying and selling the S&P 500 instead. And so that's what these density plots we're measuring here. For example, let's say this red one, this mu one, is the return and each point in this distribution is one different ticker in the S&P 500, is one different distribution of returns you can get from stocks all across the economy. Let's say that this red distribution comes from decision trees and let's say that this purple distribution mu2 comes from GBDT, let's say. So if that was the case, we could look at these two distributions and say, you know what, they overlap a lot, so it's not conclusive. In general, decision tree is giving us some kind of positive average return. In general, GBDT is giving us some negative average return. But we can also make statements, as you can see, of the standard deviations as well as the means here. And so that's why this method is more robust than just training it once, like today, and then using that to say, oh, extra trees is the best. That's obviously just going to be a one-off. And especially when we're in the world of stock trading, you can't really trust anything that comes from a single day. And so this backtesting method is much more robust and gives us a full distribution for each of these different models for how likely it is that we're getting a positive excess return over doing something much, much, much simpler, which is just buying and selling the S&P 500. And so now it's at this point that we're able to actually look at the distribution the real distributions for each of these five models in question, and that's what I'm going to put on the screen right now. So somewhat unsurprisingly, there's not a ton of variation in how these models perform. All of these, even the most complicated of these, the GBDT, is still probably missing a lot of dynamics in the stock market, especially given the very limited feature set we chose to use today. So there's a couple of nuances. It seems by one percentage point, the decision tree is giving us the highest probability of the excess return over the S&P 500 being positive at 41%. But note that that still means that there's around a 60% chance that using a decision tree regressor is going to give us a lower, a lower return than just buying and selling the S&P 500. So really none of these models are really beating the market, which on some level is not surprising. You should be very skeptical of a YouTuber who comes out here and says, I have trained a decision tree or I have trained a GBDT, which is able to consistently beat the market. And so that is what we're seeing here. There's small nuances, as we noted, linear regression is actually, interestingly, the worst. Again, not by a lot, but linear regression only has a 38% chance only has a 38% chance of giving a better than market return. And again, the others fall somewhere in between with decision tree regressor having the highest probability of beating the market. But of course, you can see that all of their standard deviations are around the same scale. Sometimes they give really, really strong returns and sometimes they give really, really weak returns. But nonetheless, let's see what happens if we take 1,000 real life dollars and use what we've learned today to try and buy and sell key tickers in the S&P 500 today. And so how that's going to go is that we're going to say for all tickers in the S&P 500, we're going to figure out what the best model is. So this is kind of an interesting nuance because you think about Microsoft stock could have as the best model, after we do this back testing scheme, it could have as the best model is a decision tree. But Tesla stock, for example, could have as its best model the GBDT. 
And Apple stock, for example, could have as its best model linear regression. And so for every single, all of these 500 or so tickers in the S&P 500, we're gonna figure out, based on this backtesting strategy for each one, what of these five models is the best one to use historically, and we're gonna use that one. So that actually interestingly gives us a little bit of hope versus just those distributions we were looking at before. Because those distributions were saying if we used that model, like a decision tree for every single ticker in the S&P 500, or if we used a linear regression for every single ticker in the S&P 500, then this is the expected probability of beating the market, which we saw was below 50%. But here we're doing something a little bit smarter. We're saying that instead of just blanket applying a decision tree to every single ticker in the S&P 500, we're gonna give each ticker in the S&P 500 its best shot. It's gonna have its own specific best model chosen out of these five models, and we're gonna go with that one. So for every single ticker, we're gonna pick the best model that's been shown from this backtesting strategy. Then we're gonna be ranking all of those 500 tickers descending by the return we would get historically the average return we would get historically minus the return of the S&P 500. And then we're going to invest in the top 10 tickers. So in a nutshell, this is just saying that we're gonna invest in the 10 tickers who historically have shown to give the highest lift in return over the S&P 500. So even if globally there's only a 40% chance of beating the market, this is more of a targeted selection strategy, which is saying that we're gonna be picking the ones that have historically shown to be winners the 10 who are historically shown to be winners. And so these are the 10, I'm gonna flash on the screen, the 10 stocks that we buy based on that strategy and based on training models right now. And so, drum roll please, let me get my other marker, da da da. We actually get a 1% lift today. We actually get a 1% lift, and so for $1,000, that's gonna be $10. Hey, that's actually one of the highest returns we've ever got from any of the experiments we've done on this channel around stock trading. And of course, the burning question in your mind is, how did the S&P 500 do over the day? And the answer is the S&P 500 actually got a very, very, very marginal negative, pretty much we can call it zero lift. So the S&P 500 would have given us nothing today, but this methodology we use today actually gave us a 1% lift, which translates to a $10 gain today. Now, of course, this is the part where I say all the caveats. Of course, that lift is coming from a distribution. In fact, we actually drew those distributions today. And so tomorrow, if we did this, we could totally get a negative 1% or a negative 2% or a positive 3%. And so fully acknowledging that that could have just been a fluke, but hey, let's just revel in the fact that we actually got one of the highest lifts we ever got, even if it probably is very much by random chance, but maybe some of it did come from our smart selection methodology. Oh, and one last interesting visual before I leave you. One thing that I found is really interesting was, remember the step where we assigned each ticker in the S&P 500 its best model from these five? One thing that was really interesting to me was looking at which was the most common best architecture across the entire S&P 500. If there really was no difference in these models, we would just expect by random chance alone that each of these models would get 20% uh, because there's five of them. Each of them would get 20% of the tickers in the S&P 500. But that's not actually what we see. We actually see there is a strong bias. There is a strong bias. 45% of these tickers in the S&P 500 have as their best model and best here is defined by all this backtesting scheme, have as their best model the humble decision tree, which was very interesting. Almost half of all the tickers we looked at are gonna have decision tree as the thing that has the best shot of giving a positive return the next day. And it is probably worth taking a quick second and thinking about that, especially in terms of the bias variance trade-off we introduced this video with. We said a decision tree has the lowest bias, but also has the highest variance. And so what that might mean is that it's actually really important in the stock trading problem to really overfit to the training data set. And that kind of makes sense given the architecture here. We're learning from these 99 days and then we're predicting on the next day. So it may be beneficial here to just really, really stick to these 99 days and not worry about generalizing to some other random day in the future, but rather just making sure that you learn the pattern in these 99 days really, really, really well and then use that information to exploit the next day, but not worrying so much about whether that translates to the day after that or the day after that or some other day in time. But even that explanation is kind of interesting when you look at the second most popular architecture, which is that 23% of the tickers in the S&P 500 have the other end of the spectrum, have GBDT as their most powerful model. 
So maybe it depends on the type of ticker itself. I'm sure there's more of a meta analysis to be done here, which I didn't do here, but could be really cool to do about what is the kind of tickers that have a decision tree as their best model? What is it about those tickers that makes this exploitation of the next day the most beneficial thing to do? And conversely, what is it about those other tickers that have GBDT at the very other end of this bias variance spectrum as their best model? What is it about being able to generalize more for them? Maybe it has something to do with the volatility or the stability of that stock or the industry that that ticker is in. Very interesting things to look at. But I think I've said enough here. Hopefully you found this video interesting. Hopefully that this uh, scheme that we laid out, this backtesting scheme was a little bit more rigorous than in previous videos. If you have any questions, thoughts, concerns, just ideas for future videos, please, please leave them in the comments section below. Thank you so much for watching until now. Like and subscribe for more videos just like this and I'll see all you wonderful, wonderful people next time.